the very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is unconscious. We will stay of things, in view of violence without object anymore. This is the typical violence of Violence because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to podcast care of Cooper Cherry. Um, before I introduce today's guest, I just want to plug the uh, the Patreon for those of you who enjoy the show. And if you feel like supporting us, you can find me at www.patreon.com forward slash pod, podcast co cooper cherry we're also on twitter at podcast co cooper instagram at podcast underscore co underscore cooper underscore cherry but i'm very pleased today to have uh, dr todd may as our guest he's currently class of 1941 memorial professor of philosophy at clemson university he's the author of tons of books two of which we'll primarily be focusing today's discussion on those are the political philosophy of post-structuralist anarchism and Gilles Deleuze an introduction uh, but also something very interesting about Todd is just, he is also the philosophy consultant on NBC's The Good Place so Todd thanks so much for uh, joining me this evening uh, thanks for having me oh absolutely so I appreciate you were among, I think that you and Saul Newman and, and Andrew Koch, you're kind of my three, you know, in the Deleuze book, you mentioned that uh, Deleuze has Bergson and Nietzsche and, uh, and uh, Spinoza, but that's, that's kind of my triad. <laughs> you guys okay. are all in, in that kind of uh, post-structuralist anarchist realm. So. Yeah. I mean, Andrew Koch, Stuff I don't know. Uh, Saul Newman, I was a one of the readers on his thesis, his, his nice. PhD thesis. Yeah, uh, so a Andrew, uh, he's really a good writer. He, I think, is uh, quite interested in Sterner, um, but I had him on. He recently did a book on materialism in the continental tradition that was, that was really good. Um, but he's like in, um, shoot, Appalachian State in North Carolina, so he's not too, too far from you. No, that's not terribly far. All right. But uh, anyways, um, I guess just to start off, Todd, before we delve into the actual meat of the discussion, um, tell me a little bit about how you, how you were kind of contacted about being the, an advisor on, uh, on The Good Place, because I think some people might find that interesting. Yeah, sure. And actually, th there are two philosophical advisors to The Good Place. I, and I'm, I'm the only one, and I'm the second. Uh, but the way I got involved was that one of the writers, Dan Schofield, had somehow picked up my book on death. Uh, and he, uh, he read it. He thought it would be relevant to the show, called uh, the showrunner Mike Scherr's attention to it, and Mike read it. Uh, and uh, a number of the themes have been adopted uh, in, into the show. Uh, but I, I should say that, that, that well, while he was reading the book, which apparently he was doing at night in bed, uh, at one point his wife came in, saw the book, which is basically, it just says death on the cover in a gray <laughs> background right. with a raven on it. Uh, <laughs> And she looked at him and she says, our, our marriage is not going to survive this show, is it? <laughs> right. uh, but apparently it did. Uh, and, uh, and we got in fact, and we started doing some emailing and some Skyping. And then before the third and fourth season, I went to the writer's room just to talk about ideas with them that they were, were thinking of employing in the show. Nice. Um. But anyways, we'll, uh, let's go ahead and we'll jump in. So first, I kind of want to talk a little bit about one of your older books, and that's The Political Philosophy of Post-Structuralist Anarchism. And uh, I think the, the quote that I want to read to kind of kick that off, and I think kind of captures a little bit of, of what you're getting at ultimately is political philosophy having only ever kind of discussed or interrogated the ought given what actually exists or what is. So in, in your opinion, where would you say the, the overlap with post-structuralism and 
anarchism is and sort of where, where do they diverge? Good. It's, uh, let me talk a bit about the overlap first, because sure. uh, it's interesting around the divergence, because I, I feel a little uncertain about the divergence in, based on stuff that's happened afterwards. You know, that book was published in 1994, and there's been a lot that's been written about the relationship between post-structuralists and anarchism since then. And some people have raised questions about my take on classical anarchism. And I think they're interesting questions and I'm not quite sure what to do with them, but first, right, the overlaps. So one broad way to distinguish anarchist theory from Marxist theory uh, is that Marxist theory has an Archimedean point, right? It's the economy. So if you change the, the fundamental structure of relationships in the economy, you, that will ramify out through society and therefore revolution is fundamentally situated in uh, the economy. Now, one view, and I think it's a stereotypical view of anarchism, is that it just substitutes the state for the economy. So where the, where the Marxists say it's the economy stupid, the anarchists are supposed to have said it's the state stupid. And I think that's, that's mistaken. Uh, I think a, a, a sensitive reading of people like Bakunin and Kropotkin uh, and uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, those, uh, those and others, even, and even up to contemporary anarchists like Colin Ward, would show that it's not... Uh, it's not fundamentally an issue of the state, but fundamentally an issue of hierarchies and dominations. And hierarchies and dominations happen in many different areas. There, there's gender domination, there's uh, uh, racial domination, there can be religious domination. And so rather than looking for the Archimedean point for change, anarchism looks for places in which people are being subject to domination, where they're being treated unequally to one another. Now, that's, I think, where the intersection with post-structuralism begins, because post-structuralism, and here probably the, the most relevant figure is Michel Foucault. Foucault refused to reduce uh, political, let's say, political oppression to a single explainer or an Archimedean point. He wanted to see it in its specificity in different areas. So Foucault analyzes uh, sexuality, analyzes psychology, uh, he um, analyzes as well political relations. And, and, and in that sense, although at the time that the book was written, the post was was seen in contrast to Marxism, I wanted to see it as continuous with anarchism. Uh, I think that they, they have those deep affinities in, in having a non-reductionist political view. Right. Now, my critique of anarchism, or the, of 19th century anarchism, or the one that I ascribe to people like Foucault, is that I, I think that, I thought at least, that 19th century anarchism, classical anarchism, uh, held to two fundamental assumptions that post-structuralism rejects. Uh, one is that human nature is ultimately benign, and the other is that power is ultimately re repressive and bad. And if you combine those, you can see how you might come to the conclusion that the trick is just to get rid of power. If you get rid of power, then the benign human essence can, there, and it can express itself and everything will be great. Now, that, I think, from our perspectives, seems to be naive. And so what the post-structuralists did, but, and again, I'm going to use Foucault as the touchstone, uh, what, what he did was say that, look, power isn't simply repressive, it also creates things, it produces things. And it isn't necessarily bad. You have to see how it's operating to, to assess whether it's good or whether it's bad. He didn't use the word bad, sometimes he used the word intolerable. And he rejected the idea of a deep human essence. So the human essence couldn't be benign because the, there was no deep human essence. And that was the rejection. And now, some people since have written that they think that classical anarchism is more nuanced than that, that, uh, um, that they don't necessarily view all power as repressive and they don't necessarily view uh, the human essence as benign. And, and I want to say that you know, some of the stuff that I've seen has, has given me pause. I'm not, I, I'm not sure what to make it. I haven't delved back into this area to rewrite anything. Right. So I, I haven't refocused really on it, but I, I think that there's some very interesting questions that get raised about that. 
And if it's true that their position is more nuanced than that, then that would mean there's even greater continuity between anarchism and post-structuralism. Incidentally, I think I would probably tag Foucault with my own. I think that he was maybe the inspiration for where I kind of delved or kind of my anarchist position. Cause I remember that specifically, like you said, the, the critique of power being this more, you know, diffuse state and, you know, maybe they're, I, and I kind of add on to it as in terms of like, yes, they're, it's, it's diffused and, but yes, kind of like a network, like there are hubs of power. So, right. you know what I mean? There's a differential. And so I still think that kind of le- recognizes that, you know, capital is certainly a large component or like whatever organ, you know, um, organizations or structural components sure. exist of capital. Those are giant nodes that are certainly sucking up a lot of, of power relative to individuals, but we're all sort of buried in that kind of, um, that kind of connected enmeshment of power itself. Yes. And, and, but with Foucault also when uses the term capital or the term capitalism, he's not thinking simply of an economic structure, right? He's thinking of political structures. He's thinking, he's thinking of normative structures. So the, the use of the idea of capitalism is very broad for him, broader than it tends to be for the Marxists. Right. Yeah. Because I definitely think there's, I mean, I, the development of the state and the development of capitalism are very much, at least historically linked together. Yeah. So, Yes. They're kind of, they kind of, you know, they're hand in hand in, in many respects. That's right. That's right. And I should mention Cooper, just as a side note, that among the things that Foucault did for me was he got me thrown out of psychology graduate school. <laughs> uh, I was, I was going to an alternative psychology graduate school and started to read Foucault and, and started to think, well, maybe the problem is not which view of psychology you're taking up, but the problem is psychology itself. And I started to raise that critique, and, and that was not well received in the graduate school that I was in. And so ultimately, I had to leave. <laughs> oh, man. Um, but anyhow, I, I want to read another quote from, from the book here. I think that, it, that it's a really good one that I thought really kind of um, interested me was a post-structuralist political thought could be summed up in a single prescription or prescription. It would be that. It would be that radical theory, if it is is to achieve anything, must abandon humanism in all its forms. Um, And let's see, there's a further, humanism as a philosophical project is fundamentally misplaced in seeking the constitution of the subject and a subjective essence. And I think what you described of Foucault's work kind of goes to that, but maybe you could elaborate a bit. Yeah, and that, that term humanism has also changed a lot. I mean, we're talking, post-structuralist anarchism was in 94, so we're what, 26 years later, and, and the term humanism is used differently now. Uh, the way it was used then uh, referred to this idea that there is a, a subjective human essence and that the role of studies like psychology and even in many cases philosophy was to elaborate that essence, uh, elaborate the ways in which we could realize that essence, uh, elaborate the ways in which we were falling away from that essence. Uh, And so the critique of humanism was really a critique of the idea of a human essence that was to be understood and or realized. Uh, It's changed now, I think, because the, the... notion of, of humanism is often contrasted with post-humanism, uh, which would be uh, the view that, uh, that say, uh, that we, we, we are on in a stage in which the next stage may be cyborgs, or that, that there's a relationship between uh, cyborgs and humans that undercut the idea of the, of the centrality of humans. And on the other end of things, uh, there are, humanism is often used to critique a focus on the human as opposed to non-human animals. Uh, so that term humanism is, a, it's, it, I, I would say it doesn't just come with a lot of baggage, it comes with, with shifting baggage, or at least the baggage, the contents of the baggage shift. So when I, when I was using it, it was, it was specifically to refer to this idea of the seeking and elaboration of human essence as a way to direct reflection on who we are and what we do and how we see our future. How does that play in for you in terms of, I think maybe the, the subject. So I think it, and maybe I'm even confusing because I think did, doesn't Foucault have the quote 
man is a recent invention and one that's reaching its end or something like that. And I think that's in the context of subjectivity is, are those kind of different things where we describing, is there some overlap in terms of what human, like humanism and subject and the human subject? Yeah. He, when he used to, that was how, how he ended the order of things. I think maybe the, even the last sentence, it was that it was going to be a race, like the, the, the human was going to be a race, like a, the face on the sea. And there he's using it in a very specific sense, uh, not even the sense that we're using it now. Uh, it's the sense that, uh, that the human is part of a theoretical apparatus that encompasses uh, not just humanism, uh, but also um, uh, certain views of language uh, and certain views of the economy and, and certain, views, uh, certain views of biology in which the human is both the investigator and the subject. It's this, uh, this strange doublet, right? Uh, and he thought that that was a historical formation that in the end was going to go away and that we maybe through psychoanalysis and such, we were beginning to see the end of that. So that view of humanism is not the same as the one that you see later. Now, when he talks about the subject, uh, he uses the term subject in, to mean two things at the same time. Uh, one is that uh, one is subjected to uh, issues of power uh, and then the other is that, that one is the subject of that. So one's activity is as a subject, but it as a subject, it is also subjected. Uh, and he wants to sort of capture both of those concepts with the idea of the subject. Uh, and it's related to humanism in the sense that humanism is, we could say, the way in which the subject is subjected. <laughs> 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 that reminds maybe, me. It's a little bit <laughs> quick, but I, I hope it captures the idea. No, I, I think you're, I definitely agree. Um, it just reminds me of, that sounds like something Lacanian, um, which I think kind of, I may even say that Lacan's kind of project was kind of erase that idea of the subject as well. Are you much of a fan of, well, interested in Lacan just out of, out of sheer curiosity? I, I, I can't hardly stand him. Can't stand him? <laughs> I, 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 I think he was willfully obscure. I'm not convinced that he knew what he was saying half the time. <laughs> um, uh, it, uh, there are probably elements that are useful, right. uh, but I, I uh, well, there's two things. One is I, I, I don't like his will to obscurity. Uh, I know he said that he didn't write for idiots. Uh, I, I, I'm not convinced that he wasn't one of those idiots for whom he didn't write. Uh, <laughs> the other thing is that, that he's part of a history of psychoanalysis. And I think Foucault has given uh, all kinds of reasons to abandon psychoanalysis, mostly in the post order of things. Uh, but uh, I think psychoanalysis is, a, is a, a very deeply wrong turn in intellectual history. Oh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> I'd be interested to delve into that with you because it's something that uh, Lacan in particular has been on my mind oh, maybe the last 18 months or I just am completely fascinated. And it's, and again, it's, I'm skeptical, like you mentioned of, of whether he has any real, um, true appeal, but I don't know. There's something about the, the contradictions, the kind of against the grain reading of his version of psychoanalysis that I just find endlessly fascinating. Yeah. Well, I mean, he certainly writes psychoanalysis as against the grain, but within psychoanalysis. So if, if you start with, uh, with let's say an intellectually impoverished project like psychoanalysis, right. And then add <laughs> a, an interpretation, right. That's going to try to twist it. I'm not sure we're going to wind up. I mean, think of this Cooper, right. One of his central uh, puns is, and you know this, le, le, le nom de père, right? Which is both the name of the father and the no of the father, because it sounds the same in French, le nom de père. Uh, and he builds a lot on that. And I'm thinking, you know, I just don't think it's a great idea to root any deep sense of your philosophical view in a French pun. Certainly. <laughs> but I mean, that makes sense with you, with you. You're a Deleuze guy and I'm, you know, I'm pretty partial to Deleuze. I just find Lacan just 
fascinating as, as a figure and just the inventiveness of the thought. But anyways, I don't want to, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go down that uh, rabbit hole too much further. We'll uh, go ahead and, and move on. And Fair enough. Uh, I, th- I think something that I thought that you brought up within uh, the post, the post structuralist anarchism book was uh, a really pertinent thought and something that really should resonate with, with revolutionaries or people that consider them ref- set themselves revolutionary is that there's often this conflict between goals and outcomes, particularly mm-hmm. in this, you know, the stakes are quite high when it comes to revolution. So I think this is in a very, something very instructive. Maybe you could elaborate for us on that, on that point as well. Yeah, if Foucault said something, he had a wonderful quote, that which I often use, uh, which is he said, people often know what they're doing and they usually know why they're doing it. What they don't know is what they're doing it does. Uh, and that, by the way, Cooper, just as an aside, is also, there's an embedded critique of psychoanalysis in that. It's not that people are acting in ways they themselves don't understand. It's that we... We, we, we more or less have a sense of what we're doing. Is that we, certainly we deceive ourselves at times, but mostly we know what we're doing. And yet when we do it, we do this in the context of a lot of practices on the ground, many different practices. And those practices interact and intersect with one another. And they often yield things that are wide of the kinds of goals that we would have envisioned or seen ourselves realizing when we set out. And that's partly because of the the complex interaction between the various practices that we're involved in. Uh, And so we know what we're doing, we know why we're doing it, but we don't know what our doing it does. Uh, And that's why Foucault said that we always have to be vigilant and that all of our political work is an experiment uh, because we don't know where we're gonna land up. So we try things, we we, we hope for the best, uh, we do our best. And then we have always to stop and reflect and see, well, what is it that we've actually produced? Uh, Is it something that's close to the vision that we had or are we beginning to diverge from that vision? I think that also requires a certain sense of intellectual modesty, uh, recognizing that you're not necessarily gonna wind up where you thought you were gonna wind up, that you don't have the key to history. And if that's the case, then we, the, the distinction between revolution and reform, I think, becomes a bit effaced. Uh, those who think we, we will just have a revolution and overthrow the fundamental structures and everything will be fine are probably exhibiting an unwarranted hubris. Uh, whereas you're going to follow Foucault and recognize the complexity of history and the, and the complexity of the kinds of practices that we engage in in their intersection, then I think you're more likely to be reticent to endorse, uh, let's say, a a sense of revolution as providing you the answer, right? It it may be that you're uh, you're engaged in a number of deep reforms, let's say, for instance, right? Uh, Anti-racism work, um, uh, work for LGBTQ rights, work uh, on behalf of the Palestinians, things like that. And then eventually there's enough of a change that you would say, okay, I guess what we had was a revolution looking at it retrospectively. Right. Hmm. <clears throat> you also have a, another quote that I, w- I want to mention here that genealogy can be considered the anarchist method par excellence, mm. which I think obviously this is drawing on Foucault. This is drawing on, on Nietzsche. But as an anarchist, I'd be curious to hear, kind of hear you dig into which, what you're really getting at here. Okay, that, that, that Cooper really ties into what I just said. Uh, it's an extension of it. Uh, so what genealogy does, uh, it, it was the, Nietzsche talked about it in this way, but I don't think actually practice it in this way. Foucault actually practices it in this way, which it, it takes the practices on the ground uh, rather than looking at history from above uh, and looking at what we might call, what some people call great man history or the history of the kinds of events you read in your textbooks in high school. Uh, he says that Foucault, for Foucault, the history of practices that form us uh, is a history of things that happen day to day on the ground. And what genealogy does is, is a type of history that traces those things and traces where they have led. 
so, um, looking at it that way, there's a couple other things we could we could say about genealogy, which is genealogy does not rely on some kind of underlying historical necessity. There's no necessary pattern, right? So for Marx, it's a necessary pattern. It's a dialectic. Uh, for uh, a conservative like uh, a Spengler, it's circular. For most people, it's progressive. Uh, we go from the worst to the better. Uh, for Foucault, uh, and I think this is somewhere, this is something that Nietzsche probably would have ratified as well. History uh, is contingent. Uh, it doesn't necessarily go from the worst to the better or the better to the worst. It doesn't have a necessary underlying pattern like the dialectics. So therefore, it's something we have to study on the ground. And when we study it on the ground, what we will see is that oppressions and dominations are things that happen in many different places at many different nodes. Uh, so we look on the ground, we do genealogical study, we see the ways in which history has unfolded, that allows us to see these various different, but often intersecting oppressions. And that would be the non-reductionist anarchist view. I see. So I, I actually, so I, you mentioned uh, dialectical materialism and I just did an episode last week um, on Hegel and we talked specifically mm. really more so about the Hegelian dialectic. Do you, do you have a, a critique beyond of Hegelian dialectics or dialectical materialism beyond kind of what you just discussed or? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, uh, Deleuze hated dialectics <laughs> just, uh, and, and because I think Deleuze thought that, that dialectics was, well, uh, Hegel's term is the labor of the negative. So it's all about something happening and then something denying it. Whereas Deleuze was, of course, the philosopher of positivity. It's, a, it's about expression, not about negativity. Uh, I, I don't want to go quite so far. I, I think that oftentimes there's a shoehorning that goes on in dialectical thinking, right? right. That's to say that, you know, that, that things, uh, that, that events are interpreted in such a way uh, as to force them into a dialectical pattern that they wouldn't naturally fall into. Yes, now, absolutely. Cooper, having said that, uh, I don't want to deny that history does have its dialectical ironies here and there. Uh, and it's probably worth recognizing them uh, when they happen. I just don't think we want to, to presuppose dialectics as the framework within which we want to interpret all of how history moves. Right. Yeah. Cause I think that ultimately, I mean, I think the kind of, for me, the biggest criticism or question for me is, okay, well, this feels like it implies this teleology, teleological aspect that I don't think is there. Like, yes, there's, I think, you know, recognizing the contradictions within, you know, whatever you're looking at is it can be extremely valuable, but I don't think that there's this, you know, movement towards absolute spirit or to towards, you know, the perfect communist uh, society that, that will eventually arrive in. It's a lot more, like you said, historically contingent. And that even includes, you know, what you're looking at, to, you know what I mean? What you're actually mm -hmm. saying composes that dialectic. That's a subjective viewpoint as well. And oftentimes, like you're saying as well, that's something that you're doing in a, in a post hoc fashion. And there's yeah. not a lot of, I think, predictive capabilities. I, I think that's right. And I actually think that some of the better Hegelians, people like Robert Pippin, uh, the, the philosopher from Chicago, uh, don't presuppose that there's an endpoint in spirit. And of course, some of the, some of the great pessimistic Marxists like Theodore Adorno writing a negative dialect because he didn't think there was going to be an endpoint either. I think you can take Hegelian dialectics without um, presupposing that there's a necessary endpoint, which both Marx and Hegel did in their very different ways. Um, but I don't think, or I'll put it this way, and the further you move from the pattern of situation, uh, resistance, new situation, uh, the further you are from what I would call properly dialectical thought. Right. Yeah. I think for me, the, it's like, yes, you may reach like the, the, if there is a new synthesis that just becomes the, 
the site will say of further of a, of a new dialectic. It's almost like a fractal. Right. It's like a fractal experience. You're sort of, you know, you're sort of spiraling through history like this and then there it's reaction, there's synthesis, you know, there's antithesis and so forth, but that's really yeah. it. There's no, there's no endpoint or there's no necessarily f- movement towards something fuller or what, what have you in like the Hegelian sense. And uh, in my show last week, I talked about this through, like if you would observe history, look at the history of Germany, right? And you had Weimar Republic, then you have the Nazis, then you have, you know, the split Germany, then it is reunification, but there's no real, it's not moving towards anything, any kind of perfect Germany, let's say. Yeah. And I, and I think the better Hegelians will recognize that. I think they they move away from the teleological conceptions of, uh, of the dialectic. But, uh, Back to our discussion, I think um, I'd like to hear or get your description of this. <laughs> I'll call it the dialectic between macro and micro politics. Mm. Yeah, this is a, this is an interesting one because Foucault focused on micro politics. That is focused upon the things in the on the ground that form us, uh, but he never denied that macro politics played a role. I think what he thought was that it was so overly emphasized um, that it neglected a lot of the ways in which we were actually formed. So it would be silly to say that, so for instance, the state has nothing to do uh, with how our lives are conducted or the kinds of people we become. But oftentimes that's, that's given as the account uh, of our lives and how they work and what our social relations are like. And that's what he wanted to resist. So if we look at, if we take that idea up, then we can say that on the one hand, a lot of who we are is a product of the kinds of intersecting practices that genealogy uh, traces the history of. Uh, And on the other hand, there are also uh, a number of practices at, let's say, a a larger institutional level that also have an effect on us. Um, And I think if you keep going down, pressing on that, I suspect, Cooper, that in the end, the distinction between macro and micro politics is going to begin to fall away a little bit. Uh, And it will fall away a little bit from both ends. So from from the macro to to micro to macro, you know, a lot of what happens at what's called the macro political level, the state and the large institutions are in fact, day-to-day practices that are forming the people as they, uh, as they engage in them. And then on the other hand, a lot of what happens at those macro political places, the the state and large corporations and institutions that has effects on the kinds of practices, day-to-day practices that we engage in. So, um, I think that the term macro and micro politics are helpful methodologically, uh, but I think ultimately they're probably not going to be tenable in terms of a strict division between the two. Right. And I can't remember if it was which book it was in, because I've, (laughs) I was kind of reading both of them concurrently. So um, you did mention at one point something about that the Mac, it was kind of a genealogical look at, this this notion this division and saying i think something along the lines of macro politics developed historically through a specific from a specific set of micro politics and those original micro politics that it evolved from no longer really exist and they're kind of being this chasm or gap between between the two yeah um I could have said that. <laughs> that sounds like something I might have said. <laughs> but I find that a really fascinating, really fascinating, especially because it's such a, I think, materialist analysis of, and I think you're absolutely right that genealogy is, I think really genealogy is a material analysis in itself. And I think, you know, I deal, I, I'm friends with a lot of Marxists. I'm friends with a lot of people that, that talk about, you know, Hegelians, Marxists, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, they're extremely abundant in my kind of circles and whatnot. And, and this is something that, you know, I think they fail to realize is that there is other, there's, 
yes, there's dialectical materialism, but there are other materialisms. Yeah. Or there's another strain and Marx's or Hegelian or Hegel's materialism aren't the only ones that exist. Yeah. No, I think that's right. Uh, I mean, Deleuze thought of himself as a materialist and he was no Hegelian. Right. Uh, and uh, Foucault is a materialist uh, in his way as well. Uh, I mean, if, if we think of materialism, not simply as atoms in the void, right, but as, as we could say, historically situated practices. Right. And I think actually, so that's why I was mentioning Andrew Koch. That was his latest book was kind of this look at ma- the development of materialism in the continental tradition, tracing it back from Kant through the post-structuralists that I thought was okay. super interesting, really, really good discussion. Interesting. But anyhow, you mentioned Deleuze here, and I think that one aspect you so you're talking about how Deleuze is defining philosophy perhaps as, as a practice of concepts, which I think is a super interesting way to look at it that I don't, that I think is, I don't know if it's counterintuitive, but I don't think many people under look at it that way, if that makes sense. Well, by the way, just, just on pronunciation, you're pronouncing his name correctly. I've been calling him Deleuze for so long. I, I just, you know, I, I can't get off of it. I was actually once lecturing on some of his stuff in, in, uh, in Paris. Oh no. And I, I was saying Deleuze and you can just hear the audience whispering Deleuze. Right? <laughs> but any cap with that caveat. Right? Hey, I, I'm lucky. I'm I, in my generation. We have Google. So you can actually look up how, do, how do you pronounce Deleuze? And there's like 50 million <laughs> results. <Right. laughs> I just, ne- I just never got there. But so in, in, in one of, one of, well, he, he wrote this with the guitar, his, the losing guitar's quotes is that philosophy is not, it, it's not about the truth. It's about the remarkable, the interesting, and the important. Uh, that's an often misunderstood uh, quote of theirs. Uh, people sometimes take that to mean that they deny that there's such thing as truth, or they deny that truth has any role to play in philosophy. And that's, that's not what they're saying. Uh, just sort of as a, as a side note, but I, I hope this is illustrative. I was lecturing at Toulouse uh, in at Notre Dame some years back, and um, more analytically minded philosopher heard the quote, and he said, well, you know, if you bang your hand against that wall behind you, you'll find there's a truth there that the, you know, the, the wall is resisted. And so I did that. I started banging my hand against the, the wall. And I said, so what I'm going to find out here as I bang my hand against the wall is that there's a truth about the wall. Uh, and he said, yeah, that's what you're going to find. And I said, yeah, but let me ask you, is my banging my hand against the wall like this, is that yielding anything remarkable, interesting, or important? And he said, no. And I said, so why would that be philosophy? <laughs> uh, uh, and that I think is where Deleuze is on about, not the, the, the denial of the truth, but the idea that what philosophy should be after is creating perspectives and ways of seeing and and questions in their responses, they're going to take us somewhere new and interesting. And, in th- and to do that through thought, I'm not, I, and here I'm, I'm not sure whether it had the degree that I agree with him, but to do that, he thought you needed oftentimes new concepts. So the idea of creating concepts and the idea of being able to open up remarkable, interesting and important ways of taking up the world in our lives were, were intertwined for him. That's a tremendous, we, so in, in online circles or kind of younger generations, we would call that an own, or we would say that you dunked on, on the analytic <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> to some degree. <laughs> so that, that's, that's pretty good. Um, but anyhow, to go on a little bit more about Deleuze and before we really jump into Deleuze in, in earnest, um, I think, you know, Deleuze is the the philosopher of difference. Yeah. And in, in the context of of anarchism or, you know, revolutionary thinking or movements or what have you, I think there's a, my question is, is that, is difference, is that enough? No. And maybe. Uh, <laughs> it's, I think it can be very helpful, uh, but I don't think it's enough. Now, remember, Deleuze is, 
he's a thinker of positivity and a thinker of creativity. So he's always asking what new can we conceive and create? Uh, that's a way, by the way, in which I think Deleuze is very Nietzschean. Uh, however, uh, I think politics is not just about the creation of the new and seeing where we can go. I think it's also, uh, politics is also sometimes a matter simply of resisting what's there. Uh, and so the kind of negativity that Deleuze associated with the dialectic and wanted to avoid uh, is something that seems to me a necessary moment in many political formations. So I don't think difference is enough. I think what it does is it's, it, it puts a check on our being entirely reactive uh, and uh, asks us to open up the question of what, might, what else might we do, what alternatives might there be, how, what, what we, can we create in, in different circumstances. But I don't think it is in its, I don't think it can serve as an entire substitute for moments of, of resistance against what is. Gotcha. Okay. I like that a lot. I guess to kind of wrap up at least the, this portion of the, the discussion about the post-structuralist anarchist book, sure. um, what I thought was really interesting was this point that you made that there is a post-structuralist opposition to capital and, and it's ethically based and, and you go, I mean, I think the last chapter of the book is predominantly this kind of discussion of, of a post-structuralist anarchist ethics, yeah. which I found this was for me, the most difficult part of the book to, to wrap my head around. Could, could you help me out a little yeah. bit? Yeah. And it, it, it's, it, it, well, of course it uses a lot of analytic philosophers who are, are quite helpful around this stuff. And I, and I tried to lay it out more in the next book that I wrote, uh, the moral theory of post which for reasons were probably not relevant to us, uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit ambivalent about the perspective I developed there. But, um, uh, but, so, but the, the idea, okay, if we, let's back up a minute. If we think of history as having a particular motor, the way Hegel or Marx did, it means history is being driven, there's, there's something teleological about it. It's headed a certain place. And if you're thinking of things that way, in some sense, you don't need an ethics because history is just going to go to that place. But if history is contingent in the way I think both anarchists and post-structuralists think, if history is contingent, then it doesn't have a necessary point toward which it's moving. It doesn't have a telos. And if it doesn't have a telos, that opens up the question of, well, where should we go? And once you open up that question, you're in an ethics, right? You're in a normative, uh, in a normative space that you need to make decisions about. And so what I tried to do in that last chapter was emphasize the normativity of an anarchist view uh, and also suggest that one element of that normativity, I think it's in that chapter, but it could be in the, the following book, is that we, we not represent certain lives as inherently superior to other lives. Uh, that, um, that we don't say, here is the proper human way to live. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that there aren't better and worse ways to live. Uh, that, but independent of our effects on others, I'm very leery that, of an ethics that would say, here's how you should be. Uh, this, is a, this is the proper way to be. It seems to me constraining it seems to me to to partake of the kind of humanism that Foucault was criticizing earlier and it seems to narrow the vision of what a human life can be uh to some very constrained categories yeah i, I would definitely definitely agree with that um do you have any any anything further you'd like to say about that or can we Maybe no, I think I, I, that, that's what I was trying to get at with the yeah. chapter. Okay, I see. Um, so next I want to delve into your intro to Deleuze content a little bit. Uh, but, but first, so I, I want to make you aware, and you, you may already be aware of this, but there's, a, there's this meme about Deleuze because, you know, obviously it's notoriously kind of um, difficult to grasp and so... Mm unique with the the verbiage and so forth so there's this meme and it and it's this kind of written thing so it goes 
Explain to Deleuze, explain Deleuze to me or I'll effing kill you. Don't dumb it down to me with some vague shit. Explain to me, <laughs> explain Deleuze to me right now or I will literally effing kill you. What the F is a body without organs? What the F are rhizomes? Don't dumb it down or I'll effing kill you. Which <laughs> I've heard this meme. You've heard this meme? Oh, I've, nice. I don't know where I have, but I've heard this meme. Uh, and and um, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, Plead guilty on the on the body without organs bit. <laughs> Rhizomes I can do. Uh, I found the body without organs to be uh, obscure, and I will say this: that I feel like I've got, and but it took me about twenty years, but I feel like I've got a a good grip on the central ideas that Deleuze is trying to promote. Um, that said, there are entire sections of Deleuze. Uh, that I have no idea what he's saying. I mean, when I read, say, the logic of sense, sometimes I feel like, well, maybe, maybe I should act like I've got the Hebrew edition and start from the back and see if that works any better. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, but, I, but I think what's really interesting about those is the, uh, are the core thoughts, uh, the, the perspective that he's bringing, which I think is, is unique and interesting. Uh, I, I should mention this as an aside, that the analytic metaphysician uh, A.W. Moore just published a few years ago, a history of metaphysics, history of 20th century metaphysics. And he said, and this is an analytic philosopher, he said, in the history of 20th century, 20th century metaphysics, there have been two fundamental original views, uh, Wittgenstein and Deleuze. Oh, nice. That's high praise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, th I mean, I, I do think, I think Deleuze's core thoughts are, are, are fascinating and original. And now you don't you don't accuse Deleuze of the same obscurantism as Lacan, so I'm gonna I'm gonna call you out on that. What's what's the oh I do there? I do oh, you do you do I, oh I do I actually <laughs> I absolutely think that a lot of what Deleuze said could have been said in far more uh, understandable ways, right? Uh, and uh, which is not to say that all of it could be understandable. Look, there's, there are technical issues in philosophy that require technical language and are difficult. Um, but I think that Fouc I think Deleuze was needlessly obscure. I, uh, I think the difference to him and Lacan was he was needlessly obscure, but he actually had something really interesting to say. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, m moving on from that, so I think the kind of the 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 germ that you build your whole or you kind of describe Deleuze's project with is this question that I think it is really good is not ones that have been previously asked. The question for us is how might one live? And I think that's a really great way to articulate kind of our, our predicament philosophically. Yeah. Yeah, and, well, I mean, if, if the way I, tra you know, I trace it, of course, this is you know, very oversimplified, was that the ancients were preoccupied with the question of how ought one to live, how should one live. Uh, the moderns uh, were, were much more preoccupied with how should one act. And Deleuze, and then you get picking up from Nietzsche, I think Deleuze is probably the, the closest to Nietzsche of most of these contemporary French thinkers. Uh, his question was not how should one live or how should one act, but how might one live? Uh, and you can, if you, we go back to stuff that we were talking about before in terms of creativity and, uh, and positivity and, and seeing uh, what, what was open to us. Uh, I think you can see that question, how might one live in the idea of creating concepts. Now you talk about this too in the, in the book a little bit. Um, but I'm kind of curious as someone who I think my primary exposure was at least early on to, and I, I've, I've not read anti Oedipus or, um, a thousand plateaus yet. How, how does Deleuze kind of differ or maybe step forward in terms of, in, in contrast to Derrida and Foucault, I think that are maybe okay, well, people that are more, I think associated with post-structuralism. If, if you ask someone right away. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and remember that term Cooper post-structuralism is, uh, it's, it, it's partly just chronological, right? Right. The, the people who came after the structures, but, um, one way to cast this, or at least to begin to cast this is that Derrida, we could see as largely a philosopher of language 
And we might even call him a person who does meta philosophy. That's to say, he asks about the kinds of language in which we do philosophy. Uh, Foucault, by contrast, uh, is, although he, earlier on he was more concerned with language, when he moved into his genealogical period, he was concerned with practices. Uh, now, those practices were discursive, they had language, but they didn't, they weren't centrally organized. His analysis wasn't centrally organized around language the way Derrida's was. Deleuze is an ontologist. Uh, that's to say, he wants to ask what reality, what, what reality consists in. Uh, and there are two ways you could take his view. Uh, one is that reality, that, that, that what he's offering is a real ontology. He actually believes this, this is what reality is. And the, or the other way is that you could say he was doing something normative, that he, he couldn't care what reality really was, but he was giving us a perspective that would allow us to create. But in any event, what he does in his ontology is to say that things are much more open, much more contingent, uh, much less settled than we often think that they are. And that's going to bring him close to Foucault uh, in the idea of the contingency and, and possible creativity of history, where those, whereas Foucault does it on a historical level, Deleuze is doing it on an ontological level. Right? Uh, and it will bring him less close, but still have a, having affinities with Derrida, uh, for, for whom the idea of a general encompassing account, a philosophical account, is always going to be undermined in its own structure. What about someone like, um, I'm kind of curious where you would see someone like Baudrillard fitting in into Deleuze Assad, or, or, those con, or is there some congruency, or is there something that Baudrillard can add to Deleuze, or how do they play? I think Baudrillard, for me, just to, I'm kind of a Baudrillard guy as well, someone who I'm utterly fascinated with, and I think really, I mean, if no one understood the moment that we're in right now, then <laughs> better than he did. So I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, I, I uh, to be honest, I, I, I very much liked his early stuff, Mirror of Production for Critique of, of kind of Political Economy of the Science, and I got less interested in him as he went along. I see. Uh, uh, it's, let me put it this way, and, and I, I know you say you study Baudrillard, so you're just probably going to ignore what, what I'm about to say. I, I think most of what Baudrillard says in his later work was already captured by Don DeLillo in 1985 oh, in the yeah. novel White Noise. Oh yeah, I'm uh, a big fan of that right. novel, of course. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think he captured it and the difference was he was just funnier than Baudrillard. But <laughs> the, the um, uh, Baudrillard paints with a fairly, fairly wide brush Right. His, his, his brushstrokes are, are quite wide. Uh, and Deleuze, although he's doing ontology, still opens up to something much more fine-grained than that. Uh, so I think one might say, well, you know, Baudrillard captures an aspect of reality that was already captured by Delillo, but that's only one aspect of, of our reality. And there's so much more and, and so much more that can be created. Uh, and Deleuze is giving us an, an ontological perspective that can help remind us of that. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think the difference now that you're mentioning it is I think Deleuze is, is far more positive. I think they're both very much in the Nietzschean framework, but Deleuze is, I mean, Baudrillard is extremely pessimistic, Yeah. but I, I will just, I will just point out that I, if I'm not mistaken, Sim, simulation and, or simulacra and simulation was probably published in, I think it was 81. So it, I think Delillo is drawing on Baudrillard to write white noise. Ah, well, I mean, if, if, if that's the case, I stand corrected. I, I mean, I think, <laughs> I, I mean, I think, I mean, it's an astute point. I think you're recognizing that, which is super interesting and very, you know, good, good catch there. But I, you know, I wanted to reread white noise today because I read it. Oh, I read it in college just for fun. And I've really wanted to revisit it because 
like Baudrillard, it seems <laughs> so it seems to really connect with where we are in society today, which is so funny. You know, that was like, like you said, 1985. Um, so it's just an interesting repetition, we'll say. Yeah. 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 And I think, and of course, you know, the book is, all, I mean, among other things, it's hysterically funny. Uh, his send up of, of college intellectuals is, is, on point, except the intellectual, the, his send up makes the intellectuals t- more clever than most intele- most academic intellectuals actually are. <laughs> Yet, an, there you go, dunking again. I right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the book, you go on, and I think this is this was maybe the part of the book. I, I mean, I gotta give it, I gotta hand it to you. I could barely put the book down, I, I had to make myself put it down and, and go to, go to bed some nights. Well, that's really kind of you to say that. And this was the part, I think this you're going through this kind of the Trinity of Deleuze, which is Spinoza, Bergson and, and Nietzsche, which I just found extremely fascinating. And, and Spinoza in particular, the monism is something that I've, I really need to read ethics. I, I haven't delved into it yet, but this may be cemented that I absolutely have to read Spinoza. So thank you for that. Well, well so thank you for saying that. But it's, it's just generous. But, but, but before I kind of delve into it, you know, we could spend forever talking about those three thinkers. I'm kind of, I had someone that wanted me to ask you what you, what you thought Jung's influence, if any was on Deleuze. Carl Jung? Yes. I don't know of any. I, and, and, and I'm, I'm not going to deny that there was any. I'm just not aware of any. Uh, was there, uh, uh, there was supposed to be, was there was an association somebody was seeing there? I have, I'm, well, I, I do have a friend that is, is writing a book on Deleuze and this sort of stuff. So I, he wanted me to ask. So yeah, I, I'm not sure what, what the context I, I'm was. I'm not aware of any. Uh, um, it's it's possible. I'm, I'm I'd be surprised if there was any anything really substantive. Uh, but I've never heard of Jung being influential. I mean, if you think of the state of French of psychoanalysis in France at that time, the the person who's most influential is Lacan, right? Who's right. hardly a, a Jungian. Uh, so, and so I think that Jung would, would Jung's influence, if any, would be marginal. I would think. Gotcha. Um, but just to start us off in kind of interrogating these three thinkers, we'll start off with Spinoza, who, who again, I think is just, I, the, the monism, I think for me, I, I don't know about you in terms of spirituality or what have you, but as someone who's kind of an atheist agnostic, this idea of, of monism is, I don't know, I find this more, more comforting and more positive than any other conception. I don't know. I, so I, I really, really connect with that. Yeah. And I think, that, I, I think he, he, you know, Deleuze saw the monism all the way back to Scotus, but he saw it really well expressed in Spinoza. And I think that's for a couple of reasons. Uh, um, one is uh, that I think it's got real, Spinoza really has a grip on it as a monism. Uh, and so he denies the idea of something external that's judging. Uh, which would be a, a form of negativity, and Deleuze is always denying negativity. Uh, um, but he also sees uh, in Spinoza the idea of um, of the possibility of, of expression and expression of joyful a- affects, uh, and this is and, and he sees that within the monism. So what he's going to find in Nietzsche. Uh, with the active as opposed to reactive, I think he sees the roots of in Spinoza, in the 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 importance of the expression of uh, joyful affects, and those can be expressed within the context of a monism uh, that of the kind Spinoza posits. That's interesting that you draw that kind of parallel. The I think it's kind of. Not something that I really anticipated was an overlap between Spinoza and Nietzsche, but I, like you said, I think there is really, there's a connection there. Yeah, I think there is, and I think there certainly was for Deleuze. But m- moving on to our kind of next thinker in the Trinity is, is Bergson, who I'm, 
really less familiar with, uh, to be honest, but I thought his conception of, of time was incredibly fascinating. Um, although a little bit, that was maybe the more challenge, like the Spinoza stuff. I really got the Nietzsche stuff. I really understood the Bergson concepts were a little bit tougher to, mm. to kind of wrap my mind around, but nevertheless, e- extremely interesting. I think they were definitely illustrative, but maybe you can kind of go on about that and kind of break that down for me and see. If well, that- well, if, if we see, um, if we see Spinoza as a monist, uh, Spinoza didn't think, uh, didn't conceive in the way Bergson did, uh, the, how to think about time. Uh, and if we are thinking about time, not as a discrete uh, series of nows, uh, but as a continuous unfolding in which the past is still within the present, uh, but it isn't, uh, it, it's within the present, right? We could say in a way that's not, not spatial. Okay, let me, so let me, let me unpack that actually a little bit more because I didn't say that very well. The, the conception of time as a series of discrete moments is spatial, right? It, we go from this place to this to this, and you, sort of, you can sort of mark it out on a piece of paper. Uh, but if we conceive time in Bergsonian fashion, it's a process in which every moment is involved in every other moment. So it's not spatial. Uh, for for Bergson, it, we tend to think of time spatially, but we need to think of time temporally. But if we think of time temporally as a process, all right, now we're thinking of it as a process of continuous expression from a, a continuous expression in which all the moments are always still there. So you have now not simply a, a spatial monism of the kind that you might associate with Spinoza, but you have a temporal monism. Uh, and that's, I think, what Bergson brings. And that's why I wrote about Bergson after Spinoza, uh, so that you could see the monism still in play, but being conceived temporally and not, ju- and not just spatially. Interesting. So one thought that immediately came to my mind in this distinction between this kind of linear view, or sp- what did you, you articulate, a spatial view of, of time, yeah. is how much this is tied to capitalism, right? Yeah. There's this very much, like there's this sequence of nows, be it work now, be it, you know, the sort of regimentation. And that even kind of goes to what, to what Foucault was getting at, or Foucault was getting at in terms of the, you know, the, the control society and, you know, making, making good subjects of, of capital through the schools and other institutions and things like that. But it also brings to mind, and this is not something I'm super well, read on so I, I may not be able to do this very well but have, are you familiar with this concept of, of time preferences i don't think so but i'm not sure if you if you if you if you, if you so, said something about it maybe i would know i'm not sure gotcha okay so again this is very very rough but so this is saying or this idea is kind of saying that different groups different cultures have a different concept of how time operates. And so something like an American, like an American capitalist, you know, society has a very different time preference than even something like a country like Mexico, like the time, there's a difference there. There's Mm -hmm. a culture, cultural difference in the way that time itself is even perceived and how that's structured and, among the capitalist societies or really advanced capitalist societies, it's far more, there's a lot more rigidity, I think is maybe the most important way to look at it. Yeah, I, I think I, I can see that. And, but I think what Deleuze is after, as he always is, uh, is what underlies that. Right. Right. What's, what, what's the ontological structure out of which these different time preferences emerge? Certainly. <laughs> is there anything else that you feel is important to consider in terms of Bergson um, time um, or, or really just in, in general in terms of Deleuze? I, I, I'm, 
I, I think I fit sort of the core aspects of it. I mean, there are technicalities there, but I, uh, what I'm trying to do is draw the line from Spinoza to Bergson to Nietzsche. Okay. Right. That runs through the book, through that chapter of the book. Gotcha. So then we can go go ahead and and move on to Nietzsche and I think his embrace his embrace of difference and you you have a great quote here. Marx and Freud perhaps do represent the dawn of our culture, but Nietzsche is something entirely different, the dawn of counterculture, which that's just a fantastic. I love that quote. I love it. Yeah, he really does think against um, against a lot of the gray. And that's, well, that's why I said that if we look at the shift to the question, how might one live? Uh, I think we see that emerging really for the first time with Nietzsche. And maybe connect us with, so how, how does... How does Deleuze and or Nietzsche's conception of difference? How does that influence Deleuze? Um, well, I think for Nietzsche, the question is less one of difference and more one. I, I think the concept of difference, the way it appears in Deleuze, is original. I think it's him. Okay. Uh, but I think Nietzsche sets it up for him by asking the question, how might one live and, and opening up that space and then using the concept of active as opposed to reactive, uh, the, that, that we, rather than being consumed by our reactions to what others are doing, which we do a lot and which of course you can see uh, all over the current political culture, uh, the active person is one who sees something new and creates. Yeah. But if we, if we take that up, then you can raise the ontological question, which I think is what Deleuze raises, of, okay, what must reality be in order for these create, this kind of active creativity to be able to take place? Uh, and I, I very much enjoyed the dynamic between this concept of active and reactive that you articulate in, in the section on Nietzsche, just as a okay. side. Great. I'm glad. I'm glad that was helpful. <laughs> now, the, the next chapter in the book is on thought, science, and language. This one was one that I think was, was a little bit more, this was a little bit more difficult for me to, to grasp, but so maybe you could help me. Point, point me in the right direction of, of what you, where you were going here. Okay, and, and to be honest, it's the science part that I remember the most. Uh, okay. I remember the language part delved a bit into um, uh, logic of sense, and I myself was, uh, have, was, was grasping at that. But this, oddly enough, it was in studying Deleuze on science that after like 20 years, I started to say, okay, I think I get, I'm getting this now. Uh, because the, I'll give you uh, an example, right? So the Nobel Prize winning chemist, uh, Ilya Prigogine, who's actually said once that Deleuze's ontology captures what he thinks sci uh, reality that science reveals to us is. So imagine this. Imagine you have a, a, a container, and the container has a slat in the middle of it. And the slat has a hole. And there are certain kinds of gases that will do something very funny, uh, which is, let's say you pour a gas, we'll call it red gas, on one side of the slat. And you pour another gas, we'll call it the blue gas, on the other side of the slat. And then you close the container. So you have a closed container, slat, hole in the middle. Uh, if you, under normal conditions, You'll, it'll get, you know, over time sort of purplish, right? There'll be a little bit more reddish sides, a little more bluish uh, 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 portions, but it's going to be kind of purplish. But certain chemicals do something very strange. Uh, the thing that they do, with certain, the, the certain chemicals, is that if you subject them to intense energy fields like heat, intense heat, they will... Uh, um, what will happen is at regular intervals, so if you, if you have to say, I could have to do this auditorily, I can't do it visually. So if you have the blue on the left and the red on the right, 
that what will happen is there'll be this immediate switch and then the blue will be on the right and the red will be on the left, all of it. And then, and then, and then at regular time intervals, it'll be an immediate switch, left, right, left, right. Uh, and he said, you could, previously it says you can study the chemicals all day. You're not going to find anything in there that's going to explain tell you this, something this complex. So it must be that reality, there's more going on in reality uh, than we see in the identities of the things that we study. Ooh. And that opens up the idea of a virtual field, right? Which is the field of difference that Deleuze talks about. And that's why I say it was really in, in looking at the science that I began to get what Deleuze was on about with his idea of, you know, of, of uh, the, virtual, uh, the virtuality of difference. Oh, wow. That is, that's really interesting. That's the thought that oh, my mind is like, <laughs> is on fire with that thought. That, that's really fascinating. But on that note, um, you kind of, you wrap up the book. Well, you don't wrap, I think maybe the, for our purposes, the chapter that we'll wrap up on is the politics of difference and kind of, and kind of what you meant by that. Right. Context and, and Deleuze, Deleuze, of course. Right. And, and, and Deleuze, in, in, in here, I, I think he has uh, some affinities with Foucault uh, that were largely created through you know, practices on the ground. And therefore, resistance has to often occur through practices on the ground. Now, a lot of the politics that's ascribed to him is ascribed particularly through anti-Oedipus, which is, a, in a way, a kind of singular work because it's responding to a period in which Lacan and Marx are both uh, ascendant. Uh, and they want to move, a, stay with Marx, move against Lacan, but move against Lacan within the Lacanian vocabulary, as we're using Lacanian vocabulary against the, the, the Lacanian psychoanalytic view. Uh, but some of what emerges there uh, is the idea that of refusing if we, if we begin to refuse the kinds of categories that we're being molded in, and in this case, certain psychoanalytic categories, uh, then we can uh, begin to, uh, to create new ways of being. So I, I'm going to see if, Cooper, if I can put this, this Lacanian stuff very quickly. <laughs> that all right, in traditional psychoanal psychoanalysis, the schizophrenic is the person who refuses to be Oedipalized, right? They, they haven't been able to pass through the stage of Oedipus. Uh, and they're seen as a pathetic figure because you need to have an Oedipal complex in order to be a functioning human being. And what Deleuze and Guattari do in that book is they say that, and which is what they call schizoanalysis, that the schizophrenic, not the real person schizophrenic, but the, sort of the conceptual schizophrenic in psychoanalysis, is the person who refuses um, uh, refuses to be edipalized, uh, refuses to be told the, to be subjected to the, the, the family drama, refuses to see the in the boss the image of the father that has to be placated. Uh, in refusing to see all that, the schizophrenic is now open to creativity uh, in a way that those who have been edipalized are not. Uh, and if we look that way, we can see then politics, and I think Deleuze sees this way, politics as a politics of creativity, not simply a politics of reactivity, but a politics of active creativity. Uh, and I, I think that that would, I think that captures a lot of what Deleuze uh, is on about. He recognizes a lot of this happens on the ground, and it goes to a core norm of Deleuze's, which is that, 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 the, the, it seems like for Deleuze, the worst thing you can be is boring, right? And, <laughs> um, and, and, and you can situate a lot of politics, his politics in there. What can we create that's interesting so that we're no longer boring? <laughs> that's the question, I suppose. Yeah, how not to be boring. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Uh, well, we, we've got about maybe 
10 minutes left. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, where, um, what else have you written that you think if, if I'm interested in, in post-structuralism and I'm po- interested in anarchism and the interplay between those, is, is there anything else? Now you did mention the book, the, the follow-up to the post-structuralist anarchist book. Is there anything else that you've worked on that you would point us to or? Um, I, I, I think you could point in a couple of directions. There's a, I, I, I read this a long time ago, but it, I remember it was interesting. Lewis Call had a book on post-structuralism and anarchism that had a sort of aesthetic angle in it. And again, I don't remember it very well. It's years and years ago that I read it, but I thought Lewis Call's book was interesting. Um, uh, and it probably would be difficult to come up with the name of the book. The, the, the other more nearly contemporary thinker that I think would be helpful to read is uh, Jacques Rancière. Uh, whom I've written on as well. Uh, Rancière takes up a, a certain politics of equality that can also be seen as a politics of once of resistance, but also of creativity. Uh, so for his view, a real democratic politics happens when people act on the presupposition of their own equality with everyone else. Uh, so it isn't a matter simply of reacting against uh, oppression, but of expressing through your actions your own equality. Uh, and I think that that has, Rancière is very close in his view. He thinks he's taking up elements of Foucault, but giving a positive political framework to think about it. So I think Rancière is close to Foucault, and there can be certain elements of creativity that, that one might see as uh, analogous to Deleuze, although I wouldn't want to push that too far. Uh, okay. so so I, that one thing we're really to begin to take up is, is, um, uh, is Jacques Rancière, and particularly a, a book of essays called On the Shores of Politics, and another book, uh, which is a central theoretical text on politics, which is the English translation is Disagreement. Nice. I, he's definitely, there's a few of those, uh, I think LaClaw and some others that are in Agamben, a few in Rancier, I think those are some yeah, guys. Uh, Agamben, is, I, I, yeah, LaClaw I think is interesting. I, uh, Agamben I never quite gotten on to. Uh, LaClaw I find quite interesting though. Nice. Um, I definitely. I'm not, I know Pimancia are a lot more. I see. I'm sorry? Oh, no, I was just saying these are a couple of these are thinkers that I'm definitely they're on my list to delve into, but I just haven't had the opportunity to just yet. Yeah, but we do have a, a few minutes left. I am curious about your your most recent book, which is the book on death that you mentioned kind of got got you involved with uh, the good place. Tell me, tell me, tease me on, on that book and what you were kind of moving to. OK, now. That book still goes back a ways, uh, the book on death. It's been picked up recently. Uh, and what more recent date on it than the date it was published. It was published with a British press called Acumen Press in, in around 2009, I want to say. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I got you. But, but Routledge bought Acumen Press and then reissued it. Ah, uh, okay. So that's and why I see With it. a much more recent date. Yeah, that's why it looks like it's got a recent date yeah, on it. Um, okay. And, and, and by the way, I just, just to say this, that this was supposed to be, the series in the old Acumen Press was supposed to be short, without footnotes, uh, inexpensive editions for people to read philosophy. Routledge bought Acumen and immediately doubled the price of the book. And I just thought, no, that's not the spirit in which that book was written. Uh, in which the whole series was written. But it came from this. Uh, I, I wanted to write a book, I, you know, for me, whether they were kids or not kids anymore, uh, th- that as they got older, I wanted, I didn't want them to be in a situation where somebody would say, well, what did your dad do? And they said, well, he was a philosopher. And they said, well, what did you learn about life? And they said, nothing. He just wrote some technical stuff, right? Um, and I, just, I didn't want, I wanted to be able to say something that would be meaningful to them. Uh, and so 
that's why I wrote the book. Uh, I wrote the book to, to ask the question, so how do, we, how do we deal with the fact that we die? And, and, and write in such a way that anybody who's at all reflective could pick it up and make sense of it. Uh, and that's where the book came from. Gotcha. Oh yeah. So I'm, I'm looking now. So your most, at least the most recent thing showing on is, Google is the, a decent life. That would be the most recent thing. That's the most recent book until tomorrow. <laughs> oh yeah. What, <laughs> what's tomorrow? Are you, are you literally I, having something published tomorrow? Yes, I have a book coming out tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Well, let's let's go ahead. And, so this, what I'll do is I'll have this out Monday. So yeah, yeah. It's 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 in a series called Philosophical Filmmakers, uh, uh, which is a series that a guy that I know developed. Philosophers read filmmakers and directors, and so he said, he asked a bunch of philosophers, uh, "Would you um, uh, could you are you interested in a director? Would you be really willing to write about the director?" excuse me, from a philosophical standpoint. And so I picked Kenneth Lonergan. Uh, so Kenneth Lonergan, I don't know if, do you know Manchester by the Sea? Yes. I'm okay, not, that's, I'm that's, familiar. Okay. that's Lonergan. He's only got three films, but they're fascinating. And I wanted to write a book on Lonergan in part because he only had three films, because that would allow me really to get deeply into each of the films. So this is a book out of Bloomsbury Press. I think it's called, Philosophical Filmmakers, Kenneth Lonergan, or Kenneth Lonergan, Philosophical Filmmakers. Uh, and it, it tries to read him philosophically uh, along three different themes. So one theme is, uh, you know, Nietzsche has the famous quote, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Uh, and I want to say, well, that's just wrong. And, <laughs> his, and these films illustrate how what doesn't kill you doesn't necessarily make you stronger, uh, and, but it doesn't necessarily kill you either. That, that there's a whole shade of possibilities among those things that don't kill you. Then the second chapter is about self-deception uh, and how you can see it in the films. And the third chapter is on what I call moral complexity. So it, there's a tendency in philosophy, more in, in analytic philosophy, to try to come up with simple analysis. So they use very simple thought experiments and what Lonergan does by making his characters morally complex is show you look there's always more that you don't know going on with people uh, and so those three themes are the themes I try to treat in, in the three of uh, Lonergan's films uh, first one you can count on me the second one called Margaret and the third one uh, Manchester by the Sea interesting um, yeah, so we'll definitely keep our eyes out for that. Uh, you know, Andrew, you did mention Lewis Call, so I've hopefully got Lewis prepared to come on the podcast in, in March. Fingers crossed. Oh, really? So you've already got you already got him slated? Yeah. Uh, so I cool. Um, actually, so he was mentioned. So in I think in your Wikipedia entry, he's mentioned as another person that's kind of in this realm of post structuralist anarchism. Yeah. Before. Yeah. Yeah. And I've just read the one book by his, but I remember enjoying it. So he did, I think what we're primarily going to talk about, he talks about anarchism through this, through comic books. And there's this famous mm. comic book. I'm not sure if you're familiar with, uh, what is it? Uh, the Invisibles. Yeah, The Invisibles. It's a Grant Morrison comic. Okay. Came out Love in the movies. 90s. Came out in the 90s, really kind of countercultural thing. You actually, actually, to some degree, you resemble King Mob, who was kind of the central, kind of central figure in the in the comic <laughs> actually believe it or not what <laughs> I hope that's a good thing i think he's a, i think he maybe he's a maybe when you were if you were a, a little bit more of a punk in your in your younger days i think maybe you'd really fit fit the mold but pretty <laughs> I, close I, I i suspect i suspect call would be an interesting discussion uh, yeah. based just on what i what little i remember from the book i'm i'm really really looking forward to that especially i mean i've it's funny. I got back into comics. I'm 37. I got back into comics maybe four or five years ago, just kind of randomly. And I've really enjoyed it quite a bit, actually, believe it or not. There's some interest. A, that's the thing now. And, uh, and some of it, uh, is, I know a lot of this visual stuff has got very sophisticated. Uh, I mean, I haven't followed it, uh, but I know this is a, uh, this is right. This is just a matter of, I'll put this way, comics aren't just for kids anymore. 
Right. I think in particular, Grant Morrison is a really inventive writer and there's all these kind of interesting him and um, Alan Moore, which Alan Moore is like the God of, of comics. They have a lot of interesting conceptions of, of time mm-hmm. as kind of this physical, there's a physical manifestation of time. And if like, if you looked at time from a different dimension, it would be just this, it would all exist as one physical thing, mm. which I think okay. is kind of interesting. I don't know if yeah. that necessarily connects, but it always kind of conjures up this idea of, of Spinoza's I concept. Of certain monism. Right. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I think that is a really kind of interesting overlap there. But um, anyhow, I think we're kind of running it, running out of time. Great. Is, is but, there any, uh, but, Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Cooper. I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to ask, aside from the book that you have coming out tomorrow, is, is there anything else that you would want to plug? Or I don't know if you're on social media, if you're on anything where we can sort of uh, be exposed to your work or anything that you have to recommend in terms of Deleuze or? Yeah, I, um, I think not. I think we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, and I appreciate your, your, your plug in the Lonergan book. Uh, uh, it, it, no, I think what, what it, 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 we might want, I want to leave it there. Uh, and, you know, I just hope that, you know, some of what I said is, is helpful in understanding, you know, or, or some, sometimes some pretty elusive figures. No, absolutely. I, like I said, I, the Deleuze book, I could hardly put down. And, and then I even felt like there was a lot of, a lot of overlap in terms of the, the other, the post-structuralism book, because you discuss Deleuze pretty extensively and there's so there's a lot of overlap yeah yeah. but again i the Deleuze book i literally had a i had to make myself put it down and go to sleep because i was kind of that enthralled (laughs) well that that that, i said this is that's really kind of you to say because most people don't consider the stuff i write page turners (laughs) (laughs) but i again it's a tremendous pleasure to to have you on the show and thank you so much for participating and, and answering my email. Just, just a random guy. That's extremely generous. Of you. And like I said, you're kind of, I don't know if there's anyone else that I could get that would, would top you as far as guests go when it comes to, you know, my interests of, of anarchism and, and post-structuralism. Now I, I, I have talked to Saul. We're going to get him on eventually. I'm really excited. Mm-hmm. I'm really excited for that as well. But, um, yeah, anyways, that could be interesting. But, uh, and, uh, and let me say this too, but I, I appreciate it, well, the time that you spent pre- preparing this and these, you know, asking these really thoughtful questions that are, you know, that, that press me in interesting ways. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I love this stuff. This is, this is what I live for. This is the stuff that excites me. This is what drives uh, probably 90% of the podcast now is, is theory and, and, and thinking about these issues. So I'm extremely appreciative of you coming on the show and, and just want to thank you and I'll let you get on. Uh, with your evening, Todd. But uh, once again, Todd May, thanks so much. Uh, You take care. Thanks again, Cooper. Absolutely, Todd. And uh, this will be podcast care of Cooper Cherry signing off for the week. Cheers. The very rules of evil, of negativity and singularity. Nothing
left but recycled, whitewashed, lobotomized people as in a block work orange. <laughs> 